Here we are at the coal face of self-employment. You've heard the big ideas and the big picture and how, how it's developing. And here we are with four people who've actually done it and know what it's like. And that's what the next half hour is all about. I'm going to bang off with them one after the other across here. And I'm not going to give you a chance to intervene unless you really, really must. In which case, we'll have to work out how to do that. And then when we've done the actual personal experience, I'm going to go back and ask them to give us some general policy points as well, perhaps. So we'll see where we get to. Um, first of all, Steve Coles, who's here. Steve, what do you do and uh, when did you start doing it? Peter, oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so my name's Steve. I run a consultancy called Intentionality. It's a community interest company, so it's legal form of something of a social enterprise. Uh, we've been doing that for uh, about four and a half years now, and essentially what we do is help uh, organisations tell uh, a robust, compelling story of the difference they make in the world. In the jargon of my little field, that's called helping social enterprises measure and re report their social impact. The jargon's always a tricky thing. Impact being a very cult phrase at the moment for social enterprise. Indeed, yep. Absolutely. And it's to do with measurability and prominence and uh, whether you actually use the money you raise and all that good stuff. Exactly. All of that uh, accountability, are you doing what you said you would do, set out to do, that might uh, lead to internal learning and development externally, could be more business. And you set it up when? Uh, April 2010, so we are approaching five years old. What were you doing before? Uh, I was juggling multiple roles, which is not unhelpful, in fact, Peter. You, I uh, paths crossed. I worked for the Salvation Army. I was the social enterprise development manager for the Salvation Army for a period. I did that part-time alongside another role as well and set in, up intentionality at the same time. So you were embedded in the, uh, in the social enterprise field. Exactly. Yeah. And you decided to do something for yourself. Why? Yeah, great question, and it's the question that all of us, I guess, will, will get. Um, uh, for a number of different reasons, and I'm sure that's the starting point for everyone else as well, partly for the power to create, to borrow the RSA's phrase, do something meaningful, do something for myself, partly very contextual, young family, uh, what, partly skills and strengths. Actually, one of the things I enjoy doing is juggling multiple roles, and that's a way to facilitate that as well. So, multifaceted reasons. And you were doing what you knew how to do, but you were taking a sort of helicopter view of it. You were advising, in fact, people are really keen on doing this social enterprise thing, and you're there to say, here's what other people think you're doing. There is, exactly, there's some of that. It's, it's what are other people thinking you're doing. It's what do your stakeholders, your beneficiary think you're doing. It's how might intangible uh, things, such as the environment, for example, if the environment had a voice, what would it say about what you're doing, for example? Those are the questions you apply to exactly. what are the people you advise. Indeed. Yeah. Now, you said you were sort of social enterprise yourself. Are you not for profit? Uh, we're not wholly for private profit, if that isn't too wordy. So we're a community interest company, um, which means we can make a profit. We are for profit. I'm not in it wholly for private profit is, I, I guess, a distinction to make between the entity and the entrepreneur, perhaps. That's slightly confusing. How <laughs> but, well, from, from the impact, the measurability mm. point of view, how mm. successful have you been in terms of sustaining yourself, making a living out of it? Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a good question. I, and the answer may have confused everyone because it wasn't a good answer, not because it's, uh, it, because it's confusing in itself. Um, we've done all right. We have traded our way to where we are now. So we're about £100,000 turnover, two employees, uh, about eight or nine associates. So we are sort of self-employment generating more self-employment. Um, no grants to this stage. Um, uh, so we're doing all right. Um, part of, I guess, why we're doing okay is because there is a wider context. You said that this impact thing, this social value thing, is, is in the atmosphere, or at least of our little client group. Uh, so we're doing okay in that, uh, in that sort of little sphere. And, and you, you took a pay drop when you started doing this? Uh, uh, yes, I went from a salary to absolutely zero, uh, essentially, at the beginning of intentionality, um, uh, albeit, to some extent, yeah, buffered that by overlapping the, the two. Um, although the points raised in the panel earlier certainly apply, suddenly my cost of the, the outgoings of having a job dropped, uh, so largely worked from home. I spend a fair amount of money on coffee, but that's because coffee shops have plugs and Wi-Fi, uh, and I'm here a lot in this building for not dissimilar reasons. Um, and, and the rewards? Uh, the in, intangibles? Yeah, I incredible flexibility, uh, ability to, to prioritise family life, 
Well, one of the great privileges, actually, as I've reflected on it, is the ability to employ other people. It's an incredible privilege. I have one other employee and others that are self-employed, but that's an incredible privilege. And the, um, the, the advantage is being able to talk about and do what I want to do. So I, I would like organisations of all stripes to better prioritise social, personal, environmental value. And that's what I get to do with every moment of my working life. I've been talking to people here about this interesting obsession that quite a lot of governments and uh, universities and things have with entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs want to grow as fast as possible. Uh, is growth on your dashboard? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, it's not really. It's not that we want to be uh, particularly small. Uh, actually, I was just saying to a uh, friend over lunch, there's a particular challenge when you're very small, as has been mentioned, you do everything from be the managing director as I'm down to the cleaner and everything else in between. So I think we'd like to be a little bit bigger, ease a bit of that pressure perhaps, but not, not massive. Yeah. Was it a good move? <laughs> so, that, uh, concerning your voice, yes is the short answer to it. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's go to Fiona Crawford. She runs an organisation called by a name which maybe sums up the whole experience, Helter Skelter. Helter Skelter. What is it? We're not putting the hell back into play, but sometimes <laughs> we might do that. Um, it's a children's indoor play centre and cafe and party venue, and uh, we're in the small town of Broadstairs. And we've been going for about five years. We're an award-winning business. We are Britain's friendliest business. And very much our ethos is around customer service. And that's one of the things that we're very, very good at. A few things that we're not very good at are perhaps the more commercial side of things. And uh, that's where life can become quite unstuck. But, of course, this was a new thing for you... Uh... Several years ago, you used to be a headhunter. I was a headhunter in startups as well, so I have had small business experience and startup experience, but this was a complete departure. But um, I, I did it because I became ill with meningitis and I took about four years to recover. And in the recovery period, I moved out of London and moved to the seaside and decided I didn't actually want to go back to what I was doing before, so I was looking for something else to do. So it was a, one of those needs-must transitions, and really looking at the market and, and uh, where there, there, there was opportunity. Um, and at that time, there weren't very many of us. But in the last five years, we, our businesses... Um, we, we started brilliantly. We had 18 fantastic months, but little things have chipped away. So rather than grow over the last five months, we've been firefighting. Well, you weren't one of these laptop businesses that people no. have been talking about this morning, um, where you just sit down, got a Surface, got a laptop, world connections, you do it. You needed physical stuff. Physical stuff. And brick, employees. Bricks and mortar, employees and legs, absolutely. And the ability to make very good coffee um, was, was all part of it. So, um, so we do have an overhead and... Um, and we're not at quite the level where we can say we're really going to profit. And we've, we've been fairly static for five years. But because things have chipped, at, chipped away at the business, so rather than being unable to go, we've had to sort of stay where we are. So our turnover has been the same for five years, pretty much. And competition. You've, had, you've got competition. competition. Loads of competition. And, and this um, entrepreneurial spirit is very rife in my area, so everybody is trying to do similar things to us. So now there are seven of us in the area. Um, one that opened five minutes away with a business plan to pretty much wipe out anyone else like me, which um, it's doing very effectively um, because it is big and um, has um, parking outside, which we don't. Yeah, um, little, little things that little you hardly things. think about when you set up. No. That parking point is enormously important Well, it is you. very important. And, and overnight, um, the council put the parking up in my street by 40%. So it went charge. from £1.70 to £2.40. And there's a whole mindset around that as well. When, when we're setting up the business plan, everybody walked. People aren't walking anymore. I think there's a real stress. And also, I've had experience of having businesses in... Um, recession, and we've sort of jumped out of them, but we've been in a period of austerity for five years, and, and that is keeping our local economy quite static. Well, we've had a very benign picture of micro-businesses this morning, mm. potential growth almost assumed, um, rewards... Do you get rewards from this way of life? It's tough, isn't it? It, it is very tough. I mean, it, I, I love what I do. I'm so proud of my business. It's a really beautiful business. Everyone makes their friends where we are. We have people who are recommended to come down to Helter Skelter because if they've moved to the area, because they will make friends. And I see them all 
getting, um, you know, partying out in Broadstairs and they haven't included me, but they've all made their friends through me. You know, so I can see that. And um, we, we have a very high quality offering. But I'm, I, 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 I sort of, we, we lost, um, we, we ha have an award-winning baby activity, which we were into the children's centres, that's been taken away. Then um, the offering to um, children um, going into nurseries at a younger age, so they're being taken away from us. Then the parking, and then the, the other people going into the business. So we're always firefighting and not able to, to go to that next level of growth, which, which we had envisioned when we wrote our original business plan. Come back to that a bit later on. Thank you very much indeed. It isn't all um, hunky dory, obviously. John Michael Sukias, you're from 20 something London. Yeah. Explain so, it, please. Uh, 20 something London is very much like the cliche tech startup laptop business. He's that you're not as American about. as he sounds, I'm right? Not, no, <laughs> no. The accent, despite the accent, I'm from London, grew up between both um, Los Angeles and London, so I had a feel of. Um, both kind of upbringings. And um, when I moved back to London, I started 20 something in London with my friend. Uh, when? Three years ago. So we both just came out of university recently, um, didn't have um, the most fun jobs that were being offered. And uh, while we were working, we came up with the idea with this purely just being out in Common Garden and not finding anything really fun to do. So what 20 Someone in London is, it's a going out app. It helps you find the best businesses, sorry, best places and events to go to, except everything we recommend are independent and local. So whether in your hometown or abroad, Milan, wherever it is, you can find something really authentic instead of being in the chains and tourist traps. Do they pay to get mentioned? No. So there's quite a lot of editorial work to do on this. It's not just a notice board that people contribute to. Well, originally, it was literally Pascal and I going and eating a lot. Um, <laughs> it sounds worse than it actually is. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we calculated over the last two or three years, we've been to about 700 places. Um, with the help of some people as well working for us. Um, but that's why we realized it was not feasible and we made a shift into much more tech focused. And you started it how? On, on a laptop where? In um, my flat, I think, actually. Yeah, so we, um, we started by first going out and paying for um, a meal and then realized there's this whole PR world of going out and, and trying restaurants and there's a whole like, ecosystem of it and that kick-started things and it became a, a blog, basically. Um, and, and that's just really how we started. So you Based got a lot a, of free meals, did you? Few, yeah. yeah right, okay. But it doesn't, it doesn't, so we... The, the You've got to keep your so, credibility, you know. Well, so we don't, we, we only feature places on our site if we like them. So if we didn't like it, we won't feature it because um, as independent business owners uh, can sometimes have a bad day, you can go into a restaurant and the chef might have been drunk, which has happened, and um, the food is horrible. So we won't feature it. And what's the business part, part of this? How does the business work? So um, the future of it. So that's the, the past. So the future of it. So you've got to establish a blog. How do you get the first of all? How do you get the word out that you've done it? So what we did was we gave stickers to all of the people that we featured in the first. We featured a hundred people for the first um, launch. Gave them all stickers, and then also had us tweet t tweet and Facebook about they it. They not only give him a free meal, but they have to put up one of his stickers as well. <laughs> There is no free lunch for them. No. Well, it was a bit of a it was a bit of a hustle, and it was um, also just sort of a trade. You know, we were very honest. We will promote you, and we'll advocate for you, and you know, promote and advocate for and us. And from that beginning, you got an audience, did you? Yeah, we had about I think we had about three thousand people look at the site in the first day, and then it just sort of organically grew until it plateaued, and then we realized we didn't really know what we were doing, running a business. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, we sort of got our act together, and, and now that's the sort of future of where what we're going. What does that mean? Got my act together. So. Um, I actually built a business out of it. An advisor in Los Angeles told me that you don't have a business and nobody will invest in you and you'll run out of money. So we came, uh, I took that on board, even though it hurt, and uh, we came up with a business, raised um, funding. I also realized as CEO, I needed to know a bit more about running a company, so I did a master's last year. Um, and then we just finished raising this month and we we're building it up. did a master's. Yeah, yes. I did. That destroyed all your business now straight away, didn't it? <laughs> Well, especially from Silicon Valley, they, they loathe higher education, but I think it was the best thing that I did. Right. So this is now a business. What did you do that changed it into a business from being a blog then? 
Well, we looked at just scalability. How can we how can we grow the business effectively, and how can we make it something lucrative for an investor to be participating in? So that means advertising. No, so we changed the model to now more curated user-generated content. So um, you, users can post things on our site, except unlike a lot of uh, other platforms, we don't allow everything on there. So only the best of a city can be on there. And then what we do is we try to complete the whole consumer decision journey of going out. So that's like finding a place, sharing it with your friends, booking it, <coughs> figuring out how to get there. We do that simply within the app. How do you make money? So we make money based off of the transaction and then also native advertising. So this, is, this goes back to more about our passion, which is about independent businesses. So looking at what is the struggle for them promoting themselves and building a, a tool and a platform that can allow them to showcase themselves to our users and, and their core uh, demographic uh, far easier. Uh, you want to grow? Definitely. So you're a conventional kind of minded entrepreneur, a growth minded entrepreneur, you want to sell out at the end and make your investors happy, you're that kind of micro business? Um, no. <laughs> no, no. Um, it's, 20 something in London is like, is a passion. I realized like about a year and a go, half ago, it's my dream job. Um, and uh, I want to grow it, I want to give a really lucrative exit for our investors, which I would like it to be uh, taking the company public and being a part of it and growing it to be something in every city. But the dream is you can go to any major city and find a really authentic meal within two seconds, really. That's your aim? That's our goal, yeah. But you're a micro business with macro ambitions. A bit. Yeah. More or less, yeah. Right, okay, now, <laughs> Eleanor Callahan, Dig for Victory, what is it? Um, so I'm a dressmaker, and I can see Dig that. for Victory really is a micro business <laughs> um, in that I'm a prime example of one of the things they were talking about in the last panel, um, someone who started off with a hobby and a passion um, and has made it into my way of making a living. And I'm coming to see you uh, the, tomorrow, I think, Are aren't you? I? And um, <laughs> I have to come and see you after work, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> You, we, you, you are still doing another job, are you? Uh, no, no, I'm not. Oh, I see. You've grown no, out so of that. I've so I've grown out of that. So, um, so I started off as a hobby, um, working from home, and I had a part-time job at the same time. Um, I joined Etsy, the website for craftspeople. Um, the business took off. I gradually cut down the hours of the other job that I did, um, and now I have a full-time job, and I also employ um, sort of five or six members of part-time staff. Now, just tell us briefly how Etsy works, because it's quite an important component yeah. of the craft, yeah. your sort of field, isn't it? How does yeah. it work? So, it's a huge international website now. Um, it's very young. Um, and it allows people like me, who make something, design and make something themselves, um, to have a platform with which to sell their products. They take a very low commission. What so is it? 3.5%. So if you, when I first started, um, I was trying to sell my dresses in uh, regular shops. Um, and obviously they have huge overheads. So they, they have 50%. to, they take 50%, sometimes two thirds. And, and they have to do that because they have such huge, huge overheads. And operating on Etsy, you take photographs of your yep, dresses? Yep, so I take photographs of my dresses. Um, and I list them on the website. And what I actually do is I offer people a personal made-to-measure service. Um, so people, they go on the website and they say, oh, I love that dress. Can you make it for me? And they send me their measurements. Um, they might have some special request. Um, and then in our little shop in Brighton, we make the dress for them. We post it off to them, sometimes the, the other side of the world. And your six part-time employees, are they making dresses? Yes. Well, um, no. Five of them are making dresses, and one of them is answering emails. So, but there's quite a lot of packing up and all that stuff to do when you get an order. Um, well, quite a it lot takes of operational a lot, stuff. Yeah, I mean, it takes a lot. The majority of the work is making the dress. Um, obviously, we have to pack it up and post it, um, and we have to take photos of the dresses. Um, but it's the we don't do an awful lot of advertising. Um, we've sort of relied on word of mouth. So, and word of mouth and people who buy the dresses and yeah. show them off. So as soon as somebody yeah. goes to a party with your dress, yeah. then other <laughs> orders flock in, do yeah. they? Yeah. Uh, wh wh where, where are your buyers? Where, physically, um, so geographically? So I would say 60% um, in the UK, 
um, and then maybe 20% in America, um, well, America and Canada, um, a few in Australia, quite a few in Germany and France. This is a micro business. How micro are you? Are you making a living? Yes. Yeah, so, um, Better than the one you were making before when you were an well, employee? Before I was a student and I worked part time in a vintage clothes shop. So, <laughs> um, are you so trained worked, in dressmaking? I'm actually not. So I did a very interesting but abstract and not very practical degree um, in philosophy and English literature. Well, you could have started a magazine, <laughs> couldn't you? I could have. <laughs> um, but I've always made clothes for myself um, and I've gradually self-taught. And this would be impossible without Etsy or something Absolutely very like Absolutely impossible. It. So for three Couldn't years... Couldn't have done it on eBay? Um, I, I tried doing it on eBay. Um, eBay is very much um, focused around getting a bargain, um, low price stuff. <laughs> um, and because everything on Etsy, because uh, we hand make the stuff in the UK, it means that the price is relatively higher compared to you know, a cheap high street shop. Um, at prices are between 100 and 200, so not extortionate, but still more expensive than the majority of clothing that's mass produced. Um, and so when we tried selling on eBay, um, we found that when we started selling at a low price, they sold well, but as soon as it, we tried to like, reflect the amount of hours that we actually put into it, then the sales totally Now, the fashion stopped. business is dominated by the most enormous margins, isn't it? 50%, yeah. 50% markup all over the place yeah. in the supply chain and things. And you've broken that, have you? Yeah, so um, we buy... So one of the things that's really important to me is that the fabric that we buy is... 80% um, of it is recycled in some way, in that we collect vintage fabric and, like, dead stock fabric. Um, so a big fashion label will commission, um, you know, thousands of me, thousands of rolls of fabric. The bit that's left over, they sell on a very low price to someone else, um, like a wholesale dealer. But, but, but thinking of the, 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 the margins you have, yeah. then 3.5% you pay to Etsy, yeah. the rest is you to divide up yes, as you want yeah, to. Yeah, we divide the, between me and the people that work with me. the conventional fashion yeah. business. And, it, and all of that money stays, that comes into our business, stays in Brighton. And you've got this worldwide yeah. marketplace. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let's go back to John. Um, how could you be helped by policy, government, organisations, other organisations? What do you, what are you, what, what would give you a lift? Uh, just some of the help and advice around being a small business is something we've heard repeatedly, I think, this morning as well. So, uh, as a relatively small business, can we spend a lot of time navigating the VAT threshold, submitting returns, uh, liaising with our accountants, and so forth? So, a sort of more ready pool of experts uh, would be very handy indeed. The VAT threshold, I mean, is, is what it is, but it's a, it, it's, a, it's a challenge when most of our clients are relatively small themselves. So, it suddenly might sort of price up a great deal. That's one of the challenges for us. Can you buy short? software that actually does that all for you? Uh, yes, and we do use that kind of software. It's still a case of, of making sure we put it in. Uh, we want to take some of that stuff very seriously as well, actually talking about the social impact stuff. So we try and buy from local suppliers and greener suppliers and so on. So we, we do a bit of uh, tracking some of that as well, which add, adds a bit to the workload, but that's our choice, I suppose. If you were advising yourself, which could sort idea. of happen, yep. what would you say? In relation to running a, yeah, a small business? Yeah, yeah. Your, in other words, well, impact yeah. so far. Uh, a few different bits and pieces, I think. One is um, to be really clear about what, what we're about, and sometimes we do that really well and sometimes we don't. It was a bit difficult um, to understand you at the beginning, wasn't it? Sure, <laughs> sure. yes, absolutely. absolutely. My, well, hopefully my little niche world understand a bit better. It's the jargon they're immersed in. Um, uh, practice what you preach. Uh, it's probably good news uh, all round. Um, Customers King is another one. Manage cash. We've heard that a lot. The, the privilege of being a small business owner is employing people. The worry of being a small business owner is employing people. 
um, that's a that's a real uh, challenge. I'd, I'd say that one of the things actually I've done well, but would be a piece of advice again to my you know, younger self, or someone else, is just seek out good advisors. You know what? If you don't ask, you don't get. And so occasionally I've met some spectacular people, amazingly qualified, you know, in big businesses, and I've said to them, come and join the board of a teeny tiny little thing. And they've said yes. I mean, it's spectacular. So if you don't ask, you don't get, and you get great advisors that way. Great advisors seems to be a, a very current theme all the way through this yeah. conference, yes? Mm. I think so, yeah. Actually, self-employment is misleading in a sense because none of this is self. It's, it's very little individual. Actually, my self-employment experience is very much a team experience, a collaborative, conversational experience, a relational experience. Yeah, and I have Ros behind me, yeah. yeah. yeah indeed. Yeah. Fiona. Me. Um, yes. What, 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 what do you want? What do What I would want? help you now? Um, I, I think I'd like to, to see micro-businesses separated from SMEs, because we are a different body, and, mm -hmm. and um, oh, you thank you, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> you know, we, we don't have, we're not making that much money, and the margins are probably not that great until we can move up to the SME. I, I, um, I'm not very good at my paperwork, and, and I'm not the only person in the world, and uh, I've had fines, I've been fined for putting Tax in... fines? Yes, for putting in paperwork a little bit late, and I'm getting fined um, at an SME level, so 0 to 50. So, you know, that £300 to an SME employing 50 people is probably peanuts to me. That makes quite a big difference you on my bottom line. Across the wrist, oh, though. do you know? I just want someone to do it for me, but I don't want to pay them. <laughs> That's the problem. I don't have the money to pay them. The the other thing is, you know, I'm being really realistic. Zero rated contracts. I hate them, but that's how I'm surviving. Mm. I have a wonderful, flexible staff. I'm going to have to start paying pensions. I can't afford pensions. I can't afford to pay myself. I can't afford to pay VAT. I'm spending eight, ten thousand pounds a year on VAT. And I'm not even making that myself. Mm. So, you know, there are all these sorts of things where, because I'm so small and so squeezed and I can't quite get out of level, I can't change. And, and I can say for where I live on my high street, there are loads of us like that. And, um, and you represent the high street as well. I think in I do, yes. yes. No, no, definitely. I mean, you've got a, an active oh, role yes, in yeah, that. I'm, yes. I'm chair of the local chamber. And so that, and, and also, again, access to really good advice. I, I, I did take financial advice, it was terrible terrible advice, you know, and um, I, I had a high street accountancy, I'm very sorry, but they didn't know about um, flat rate VAT. You know, I had to tell them about that, so I lost money because of that. And, and so, you know, um, and there are loads of, you know, there are loads of us, I, I just used the analogy that, you know, the unsuitable boyfriend, it's not going to stop you going out with them. It's not going to stop you starting your own business because you have a drive and a passion, you want to do it. But, you, you know, there are a lot of us making mistakes and, um, and struggling. And I think that there just needs to be some levity with HMRC um, and understanding of these people. We're not trying to cheat the system, do anything wrong. We're just probably, you know, not so good at certain parts. I'm really good at customer service. I'm Britain's friendliest business. We do, we have a really good quality offering, but I'm rubbish at administration. And I think there are a lot of us out there as well, creative people, and are usually not that good, but we don't want to pay for it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I see difficulties there, but anyway. <laughs> John Michael, um, what would help you now? You've got your degree, you've, uh, you know how to run a business. What do you need next? To be honest, I have to say the government has created a great environment for a tech entrepreneur, so I pretty much have what I need. I just need to deliver on um, my part of it and, and the team's part of it, which is building a successful business. I think it's more what I could have used maybe three or four years ago, um, which is more on the educational side, knowing, well, in, in school and in, in university, more um, learning some of the, the admin type stuff that, um, Fiona. that uh, Fiona was talking about, sorry. and. Um, and then also sort of being challenged to create and, and having that environment of, I guess, celebrating failure because you don't try thinking that you're going to mess up and your career is ruined, so. But you have learned an awful lot. Yeah, you, but I could have. If you were working within a large business, you wouldn't have learned half this in the last three years, would you? M maybe, maybe, but I think, I think it's more about... Um, putting young people in that environment where you think that you there are those resources that you I think it's more about demystifying the spreadsheet because you you look at like running a business and you're like how can I how can I do that how how do I understand VAT and and PAYE and, and all of the complexities of running a business so you might have an idea and you might be working in say an ad agency but you will be intimidated to go out and try and do that because there isn't that 
availability of information. But once you, once you make that step and you get into the whole tech community and startup community, you see how much support there is for you. And it's more about providing that education to people when they are going through university or through their schooling that this stuff is realistic to do. Eleanor, the way you told it was beautifully straightforward. You wanted to do it, you did it, it works, you employ people, you make money. Yeah. Any snags in all well, this? <laughs> well, the, the snags would probably be that, I mean, I don't make a lot of money. I make a small amount of money. <laughs> and I work a hugely long number of hours. Um, I actually, at the moment, I'm not particularly interested in trying to grow the business further what I'd like to do would be to try and rearrange the business and my life in it so that I don't have to work non-stop and I can I take a holiday. the awful <laughs> thing about a business that grows out of a hobby might be that something you love to do becomes a curse because it's, yeah. you're shackled to yeah. it. That's a perfect possibility of yeah. this. You I mean, do something because you really want to do it and it turns out to be think, awful because you have to do it. I think it's, that's why it's important, or for me it's important, not just to try and pursue growth at any cost, um, and to try and remember that the reason that I'm in this industry is, is because I love it and I'm passionate about it, about dresses. <laughs> um, and, but the, uh, like Fiona was saying, the, you know, there's lots of hurdles, like there's lots of things that I've had to learn which aren't things that I'm passionate about, like how to do a VAT return. Um, and but PMI. one thing that could happen to you, we've heard earlier about big businesses who are trying to get entrepreneurial by yeah. doing entrepreneurial things and all that kind of thing. One thing that could happen to you is you're establishing a marketplace for the clothes you make yeah. that a great big company could say, we want to range from you. That might happen. That's a perfectly reasonable way of a small um, business to become a... It would, the way that our particular business works, it, it wouldn't work in that way because we, um, I don't produce clothes and then sell them. Um, I create designs and then I wait to get orders from my individual customers and then we make them, we um, make to measure. So it's something that it couldn't be replicated on a larger scale. Uh, I mean, it could be, you know, could be on a slightly larger scale, but it couldn't be on the scale of like a high street clothing retailer. So this, this two-way, so it's this kind craft, of a naturally this craft inbuilt interface is yeah. very important. Yeah, um, it would it would be a totally different business. We if, clothe you, we feed yeah. you, we give you games, and then we assess you at the end of it all. <laughs> Thank you very much, panel. That's what it's like at the coalface of self-employment. <laughs>